Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Hello, my name is Ray Gerard. Welcome to another edition of St. Paul's Letters to America, the show that asks, what if we took St. Paul's letters and changed the name on them as if they were letters to America. This program is built on the idea that St. Paul's letters, like all of the Bible, are timeless, that they speak truths applicable to us and our lives, not just as they were to the Romans, Corinthians, and others of Paul's day. We seek to examine his thoughts and exhortations to inquire whether what he says is in fact true, grounded in the universal truth of God, and if so, what we in America should be doing differently in accordance with them. Last week, we uh, examined the idea of uh, America as a nation unbecoming itself, using freedom to become divided against each other as opposed to being united as one nation, all of its people being equally valued. This week, we're going to uh, engage in a program that's titled The Only Important Thing is Not to Seek Importance. The letter for which we turn this time is a letter of St. Paul to Titus, specifically from chapter 3. And St. Paul tells us, or tells um, the people to whom the letter was addressed, um, remind them to be under the control of magistrates and authorities to be obedient, to be open to every good enterprise. They are to slander no one, to be peaceable, considerate, exercising all graciousness toward everyone. For we ourselves are once foolish, disobedient, deluded, slaves to various desires and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful ourselves and hating one another. But when the kindness and generous love of God our Savior appeared, not because of any righteous deeds we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the bath of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he richly poured out on us through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that we might be justified by his grace and become heirs in hope of eternal life. This saying is trustworthy. Now, what is St. Paul telling us in this letter? He's telling us to be obedient to authorities, to be peaceable, considerate, gracious to everyone. He is extolling the virtue of obedience. He is telling us that what we need to do is not consider ourselves over those who may have some kind of authority over us that we are to regard ourselves as less important in some ways. If we're to be obedient to the principles of God, then we're to always be obedient to them. If there are people that have positions of human authority over us, we are to be obedient to them as well in all occasions when that's proper, unless those authorities are, are you know, requiring something that is contrary, for example, to the laws of God. But it is not to seek our own importance. It is to instead accept a position of some humility. Now, is this, is this recommendation to obedience something that we're comfortable with, something that we can understand and accept? I mean, today it is more often than not uh, thought of as, um, you know, well, that our lives are thought of as, as being one where We need to exert ourselves. We need to assert ourselves. Uh, We don't need to be obedient in many different contexts. And we'll explore that a little bit later. But if we are obedient, uh, this whole concept of being obedient, uh, you know, it can at times, as an example of how it might seem um, a a little unnatural or perhaps uncomfortable to us, perhaps uncomfortable is the much better word, uh, there's another, uh, for example, uh, reading from Paul that, uh, that I'm reminded of where he's talking about slaves and masters. 
and he's telling slaves, slaves to be obedient to their human masters with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart as to God. Uh, how could someone be recommending to slaves that they be obedient to masters with fear and trembling? Everything that we in America now think of when we think of slavery sort of shudders at this kind of a concept. Our experience with slavery was a bloody one. Half a million people dying in a civil war and generations afterwards still suffering from the vestiges of that whole experience and the centuries of slavery that had taken place before then. So we're very sensitive to that. And yet Paul is telling slaves to be obedient to their human masters. So is he somebody who approved of slavery at the time? Is this his concept of, of, of obedience? How could humans have any kind of intrinsic value in their own persons? How could they have the dignity accorded them by God by being creations in his image if, in fact, some humans are to be slaves to others? Well, in point of fact, what Paul is really talking about is being a slave to Christ. As he says in that other reading, he says, you know, be slaves with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. That is the same concept that he's talking about here when he says, be obedient to magistrates and authority, be under their control, um, slander no one, be, slander no one. It, whoever's exerting this control over them, do not grumble, do not gripe, but be peaceable, considerate, gracious to everyone. Why? Why does that make sense? How does that, how does that, you know, coinc- or correspond to the ideas that we have of, 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 of everyone having their own human dignity? Well, it's because Paul, like everything else, puts this on a higher plane. He connects it to a higher plane. And we'll get to that in one second. First, let's consider, is he correct? Does this make sense? What are the things that we could look to to see if his suggestions and recommendations about being obedient are, in fact, truthful? What is to be gained? I mean, one, one way of examining this is to, see, is to say, well, what is to be gained if we are obedient? and then compare it to the situation that would occur if we're not obedient. So what's to be gained if we are? Well, would you not have a certain peacefulness about you? If, in fact, you are, let's just not, let's not say a slave master, but let's say you have a job, and that job requires hard labor, and you have a boss, and that boss is not exactly the most gentle person in the world, but he's, he's prone to ridicule and he badmouths, you know, his workers often. And if you were one of those workers and then would turn to him or react to him or interact with him with graciousness, with a, a gladness of heart, how could that be? I mean, what, but if you were, would you not? Be peaceful. Wouldn't you have to be? Wouldn't that be what's required in your heart? A peace that comes from knowing that this is not the all important thing, that the really important things are whether or not you show kindness to other people in imitation of Christ. And so hopefully may find favor with God after this life is over. That is the important thing. That is the the higher plane that Paul obviously has in mind. Also, this type of obedience would give us an occasion to extend kindnesses and love to other people, probably who are not expecting them at all. And that may affect those people for the good. Also, it involves a certain level of self-sacrifice. We would swallow our pride. We would agree not to consider ourselves as important, that we would think that the important thing, rather, is to seek unimportance, to seek unimportance, to be joined one with with Christ. And if we are one with Christ, then there's nothing else that we need. He is all important, and that is all that we need to aim for. And this, this, this idea of sacrificing our own wills, is that not completely in accord with the example that Christ set? 
His life was one of self-sacrifice. The very, well, I mean, obviously we can, we can, we can understand, we all understand that that's, that's what um, he gave us as an example. That was the reason um, that the door to eternal life was even opened. There are all these guys. Being obedient is not simply being obedient to um, a particular person at a particular time. It is being obedient. It is nothing less than being, being obedient to the will of God. If, in fact, we are in a certain situation like the one I just described where we've got a job that requires slave labor and our boss is not exactly the, the kindest person around, we're in that situation. That's, that's our life. And for whatever reason, that's where God put us. And if we accept that, we are not necessarily simply accepting the harshness of the boss. We're accepting what God had in mind for us. Now, what is another way, perhaps? I mean, that is the concept. What is another way, perhaps, of, of looking at this? How do we know that this is, this is right, this, this kind of obedience the self-effacing obedience. How do we know that this is right? Are there other people um, who we would consider reliable sources, who would we consider good models, who have done uh, or have acted similarly? Well, we've already mentioned Christ's obedience um, to his father, even to the point of death on a cross. Also, just the very idea that he uh, became man, that he humbled himself to the point of becoming human in obedience to his father's will. I mean, you know, and then obedient to uh, Joseph and Mary when he was a child. I mean, Christ did not exempt himself from being obedient. He did not, equ- who was the only person, who was the only one not, uh, who, you know, doesn't need to obey somebody else, God himself. Well, Christ did not uh, deem equality something to be grasped at, whether he humbled himself. There is no better example than, than Christ. Second, obviously, Mary. Mary, when being told by the angel that she was to bear a child, even though she had no relations with man, simply said, be it done unto me according to your word. She obeyed. And now she is the queen of heaven. Joseph obeyed. Her husband, Joseph, obeyed. Even when it seemed extremely hard to him, he was supposed to marry and, uh, and, and, and have a spousal relationship with a woman who was now pregnant with a child. How could he accept that, especially in his day and age? And yet he did. He obeyed. Do we have any examples uh, I get closer to our current age, perhaps, rather than going back thousands of years? Well, yeah, we do. One of my favorite uh, stories about Padre Pio, St. Padre Pio, was uh, when he was under um, scrutiny back in the 1920s. He, by that time, had had the stigmata for about 10 years. Uh, a Capuchin priest living in Italy, a uh, little town uh, in the southeastern region of Italy. Um, he had had the stigmata, the wounds of Christ, the visible wounds of Christ on his hands and his feet for some 10 years, when in the 1920s, um, having gained a great deal of notoriety with the people in the area because of the many physical healings, miracles, and extraordinary events that were taking place around him and being so beloved by the people in the area and garnering, yes, some jealousy from other uh, members of the church who had then cast some aspersions or accusations uh, about him to higher authorities in the church. Um, was the subject of a transfer order. A priest had been ordered to go down to uh, where he was serving in San Giovanni Rotundo and to tell him, to demand obedience from him to a transfer. They were going to transfer away from the community in which he was living in, that he had always lived and loved. And this person arrived late at night, came to Padre Pio's room, and read him the order that he uh, was bearing with him. Padre Pio immediately said to the man, uh, to, um, to, he, well, basically, Padre Pio crossed his arms on his chest and replied, 
I am at your disposal. Let's depart at once. When I am with my superior, I am with God. The, the messenger, the priest, the priest who carried this order replied, you mean that you want to come with me at once now? Why, it's the middle of the night. Where would we go? This, this was, it was in fact midnight. But Padre Pio didn't hesitate for a minute. The priest after this, this messenger went back and reported that he had no trouble securing obedience from Padre Pio. And a lot of the fears and doubts about him were dispelled by this simple act, this one simple act. Padre Pio also said that basically, if my superior, he said, not basically, but he said, if my superiors ordered me to jump out of the window, I would not argue. When people defended him against uh, church superiors, he replied, you did a wicked thing. We must respect the decrees of the church. We must be silent and suffer. He said, do all within the church. Act only within the church. We must beware of putting ourselves against our mother. Sweet is the hand of the church, even when it batters us. He understood the value of obedience, the value of this virtue of obedience. Why? Why would he consider it so so high, so important? Because he did not, he would not make himself more important than his superiors. Um, this any 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 assertion of superiority against authority, if that authority is appropriate, is pride. It's it's the opposite of humility. Humility being the the, the foundation of all the other virtues, as has been said, um, would be violated here, and Padre Pio would not come to that. Another example we have just in recent days is to be found with the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. They just recently met for a uh, for a conference to discuss and consider things to be done in light of the sexual scandal involving priests. They had several items on the agenda to uh, potentially be voted on. As soon as the conference opened, the president uh, of the organization stood up and announced to everyone there that he had received a letter the night before from Pope Francis saying that they should not vote on the two measures they had under consideration. They should take no action but wait for an international conference of bishops to be held several months later. It was very hard for the U.S. bishops to obey such a directive. They're feeling intense pressure here in the United States. They're people who want something done. They will have to answer. If they don't vote on this and take any action, they will have to answer uh, more people. They'll have to answer questions from the press. They'll have to answer victims. Why aren't you doing anything? They'll have to have answer charges that they're engaged in a cover-up. Things. It, it, this is not an. This is. This is not an easy instruction for them to obey. You know they did. They knew they must. They also followed um, this this instruction of obedience that Paul was giving us and Paul was explaining to us so many years earlier. Well, if this is the case. If it is in fact true that we are supposed to uh, obey um, these authorities, um, can we also find perhaps um, evidence that this is correct from situations where people don't obey? If we look at the reverse side and look for the effects of occasions when people choose not to be obedient, perhaps we can see again whether or not uh, this is this is the appropriate thing to do. Turning back to the letter from Paul, what does he say? He admits that he also uh, was not obedient. He says that he himself was once foolish, disobedient, deluded, slaves to desires and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful ourselves and hating one another. He talks about being deluded. He talks about what kind of delusion is he talking about? Well, given the passage that I quoted earlier, 
where he's talking about being slaves to Christ, uh, doing the will of God from the heart. We can see that he has a vision which puts obedience on a higher plane. It is obedience to God. If we are in a situation here on earth, there's a situation that God has allowed us to be in. We should not grumble. We should not complain. We should accept it with gladness. That's the vision that he has in mind, that this is from God. So if he's saying now that when he was disobedient, he was deluded, then he didn't understand that. He didn't have everything um, directed by a vision uh, above to heaven and to God. Perhaps his vision was more geared towards things here on this earth, things that he wanted, things that he thought. When he was persecuting Stephen and the other early early Christians, he thought that was correct. He thought that was right. So, you know, that's when he was deluded, when he changed his viewpoint such that he simply surrenders to God, then he could see, in fact, the difference. But before, he was a slave to desires and pleasure, living in malice and envy. Slave to pleasures and envy. That is, of course, the subject of much disobedience. When a child, you know, says to a parent, No, I want it now. And the parent says, no, you can't have that candy now. But I want it now. And the children and the child throws a tantrum. Why? Is it not because of the the pleasure, the desire that the child seeks? Or when other people break the rules of society, you know, society says we can't steal. Well, if I want something that my neighbor has and I choose to steal it, then society tells me that you have to go to jail on account of it. It's not our trouble born from the desire for the pleasure, the envy. And then lastly as well, Paul talks about being hateful, hateful. When we're disobedient, we can become hateful. Well, yes, of course. If we're disobedient, if we look at some human authority and say, no, I will not, what often accompanies that? Is it not often the case that we perhaps justify things to ourselves by saying what that person is telling me to do is not right? That person is is wrong about that. He's telling me this because he doesn't care about me or whatever else it may be. And all of a sudden thoughts start to occur to us uh, in a negative way against that other person. And then they grow and grow and we become. Paul puts this on the plane of being hateful. Unless we keep peace in our heart and we accept whatever comes our way, whether it's good or ill, that's where things will lead. It will lead to anger and hostility towards other people. And that, in fact, can be seen by uh, occasions where obedience is lacking. So if we do uh, look to the flip side and say, well, can we prove our, our, can we prove the virtue of obedience by looking at situations where obedience is lacking? We can see exactly, you know, what Paul's talking about, that it does lead to hostility, for example, among other things. Um, one recent example, it's in the news. We don't have to go very far for this one. There is a White House press reporter, and he recently Uh, gained a great deal of notoriety because he was asking questions of the president and the president told him to stop asking the questions or that he didn't want to answer anymore and he refused to obey. He would interrupt the president, kept demanding answers to his questions um, and just would uh, would not accept the direction from the president uh, to cease. A, uh, a White House intern, I believe, uh, but it was a young lady, approached him, and uh, in accordance with, I think, a direction she had been given, attempted to take the microphone out of this particular reporter's hands. He gently, I mean, he, he pushed her hand aside. It was gently, it was not aggressive, but he, gent- but he did push her hand aside. Again, he refused to submit to the authority that was, you know, that was, that was 
you know, presenting itself to him at that time. He then went to court to assert the fact that he was right. The court actually found in his favor saying that the freedom of the press couldn't be abridged because in that particular case, proper rules were not set up. The, I suppose the argument is that he didn't know. He wasn't supposed to behave in that way. I find that hard to understand, but nevertheless, that was the, the ruling from the court. And so I believe now the White House press corps is going to have rules imposed upon it about proper behavior, perhaps not interrupting, perhaps surrendering a microphone and being told to, perhaps acting with graciousness toward everyone. If, if in fact, this reporter had in mind Paul's letter at the time and was determined to follow it and was acting with graciousness toward everyone, would he have continued to do what he had done? Would it, would it have been necessary to go to a courthouse with the White House press corps, not have these rules imposed upon it, where these adults at the highest levels of our society, the highest levels of achievement in their profession, are now being treated like school children in a way? Sit down when you're not called on. I mean, it sounds as if... Um, there are going to now need to be rules for these people um, that they're going to have to obey as if they were school children. And in fact, there is, there's good, there's a, there's a very uh, clear connection here. We can look to school children, for example, in our society today, see whether or not they're being obedient. They're being taught the value and virtue of obedience. Because if they're not being taught that value and virtue at a young age, what can we expect from them at an older age? Will they perhaps act like adults? Um, in, the case, in the case we just cited, who will, you know, adults who will not bow to authority. Well, let's see. Um, how, how young uh, can perhaps we find examples of disobedient behavior? How about as early as kindergarten? Well, yeah, we can. Um, in Philadelphia, for example, in 2016, some 5,667 children under the age of 10 between, the, uh, between kindergarten and third grade were suspended from school, suspended from public school. Suspensions that occur only for egregious conduct. Uh, one such occasion of a suspension occurring when a certain teacher, Heather Kiausis, was seven weeks pregnant. She was teaching third grade. There's a third grade student that she had who didn't agree and didn't want to obey what she was telling, what she was telling him. So he punched this pregnant woman in the stomach. That child was suspended by the school principal. What brings a third grade student to the point where he actually punches a pregnant mother? Perhaps he didn't know she was only seven weeks pregnant. But that's really no consequence. He punches a teacher. Third grade, a small child punching an adult punching his own teacher. If that is his situation in third grade, what is his situation going to be in fifth grade, in high school, as an adult? Will he end up in jail? Who is teaching him? What is society teaching this child that he, is, that he thinks that that is perhaps um, doable? But, and as... As that statistic I just quoted show, he's not some isolated case of an aberrant child who's just exhibiting some highly unusual behavior. Be under the ages of 10, in one school year, in the Philadelphia system, something approaching 6,000 students in that age bracket were suspended from school. This is a societal problem. How about fifth grade? I mean, if we, if we play this out, if a, if a child's willing to commit a physical violent assault in third grade, would it perhaps be conceivable that he would do worse 
several years later, perhaps in fifth grade. Well, in South Carolina, earlier uh, this year, a story appeared about a student who uh, had a little note that he wrote to himself, some things he needed to do. And on the top of that list were three words, kill Ms. Turner. Three words, kill Ms. Turner. This particular teacher um, quit her job as a teacher. She is now working at a, in a nonprofit organization, and she says the worst day in her new job is better than the best day she had teaching. She had been a teacher for 12 years. She used to, there were occasions when she would cry on her way driving into work in the morning. She used to have a prescription of Xanax to help her cope. It was a situation that eventually she simply could not, uh, could not cope with any longer. Uh, fully one-third, there was another study that came out that said fully one-third of, of teachers had admitted to considering quitting for similar reasons. Um, you know, this, this particular teacher simply uh, you know, said, all it takes is one defiant kid who gets his way day after day to destroy a classroom. One student like this who gets his way can destroy an entire classroom. Well, what happens if you have 6,000 in one school system in one year? What are all the classrooms like? And if, in fact, this is what the classrooms are like, is there any teaching of the value of obedience that is effectively being communicated to these children? Um, so if that's fifth grade, what about high school? Can we expect that in high school situation is going to be, uh, is going to be, uh, as diff- you know, as we would expect? Well, yeah, uh, there's a high school principal in Florida who estimates that, uh, over the past three years, she has had 20 to 25, just in one school, 20 to 25 violent felons in her school, some wearing electronic ankle bracelets, electronic ankle bracelets, students walking around a school, um, you know, some with, some with book bags and some with ankle bracelets. Uh, I mean, a, a person who perhaps didn't frequent the school often, uh, first coming into it might wonder whether or not he's in a prison or a school. Uh, I mean, how can this be? If we are effectively teaching this value, and if we are not teaching this value, then are we, in fact, going down a path contrary to what is true? Um, so, um, so uh, as a matter of fact, and, the, and again, these cases are not isolated. They're not unusual. Uh, Julie Lewis staff attorney for the National School Boards Association, uh, told the reporter that we have examples of kids who have sexually assaulted their teacher and are then returned to the classroom. This is what's happening in our high schools, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, This is what's happening across our country. Can we, in fact, can we, in fact, sustain this? Why? Why? How have we gotten to this point? Why? Have things gotten this bad? Well, one of the reasons um, is um, a program or a a new category um, in the uh, educational industry known as emotional disability. There's a woman in 2013 who signed in as a substitute teacher for a day to take over uh, an emotional disability classroom. The emotional disability classroom is where kids are sent who exhibit some type of behavioral problems. But what teachers report is that over the years, um, since a, a law was originally passed in 1975 that saying disabled kids had to have every bit as good an education as any other student, it had to be provided with accommodations and modifications so that they could get that kind of an education. A well-meaning law, to be sure, has been interpreted over the years to include children with, quote-unquote, emotional disabilities. And the tendency has been any time a child exhibits behavior that is hard to control, they are classified as having an emotional disability. And they go to one of these 
that can be put into one of these classrooms or programs. And this particular, this particular uh, volunteer for this one day was in uh, this emotional disability classroom when a little girl came in. She had been rude to the teacher. And then she was rude to this volunteer as well. She ta- tore up her assigned work, went to the corner of the room where she screamed and bawled. And then another aide came over and pleaded with her to stop crying and told the child, if you stop crying, I will give you a quarter. And when that didn't work, she said, well, if you stop crying, I will give you a dollar. And in fact, um, a lot of these emotional uh, disability programs have rewards uh, features built into them. Behavioral specialists have consulted and, and designed programs where kids can earn toys, candies, or movie tickets. In this particular school district where this volunteer worked, uh, the reward was usually promised early in the day. So the children would act up. They would game the system, as this volunteer said. They would act up all day long. And then in the last hour or two, they would simply curb their behavior so that they could get the promised reward. This was not teaching them to be obedient or to you know, engage in better behavior. It was simply teaching them that they could engage in all the bad behavior they wanted and still get a reward. Um, it's, it's a problem that this particular volunteer you know, noted from the teacher, teachers and, and professionals that she interacted with. She said most of the kids in these programs are good kids. They're not born this way. They don't have organic emotional problems. They don't have true psychological problems. They're simply taught in our schools that bad behavior works and that if they see other kids getting away with it and they don't, perhaps they won't be as cool as the other kids. It's, uh, it's sort of a, a vicious cycle. Um, and these students learn that they can game the system in various ways. Uh, one way is, you know, the, the rewards that they're being promised. They can, they can, they can understand that, that, you know, they can, uh, they can trick the adults. Another way is to threaten the adults. Lawsuits now have become quite commonplace. Uh, in 1975, the Supreme Court decided a case called Goss v. Lopez. And in that particular case, there were several students who were suspended from school. Why? Because they were brawling in a lunchroom. The principal actually happened to be there and was the first person I witnessed to the events. And he suspended the students. He saw the activity himself. The case, a case was filed. It went all the way to the Supreme Court, not involving the students, but involving the principal of the school. He was the one on trial. And what the Supreme Court ruled was that he was, in fact, guilty, that he should not have suspended the students who were engaged in a physical fight. Why? because he didn't give them a proper hearing. He needed to give them an act, something akin to a court hearing where they could bring in witnesses and they could challenge his decision of a suspension. The students could engage in a violent fight, a fist, you know, throwing fists or whatnot. They can engage in a violent fight in the school. And when the school authority, the principal, said you're suspended for whatever period of time they were suspended, because this behavior is not allowed, um, the principal was then called to account and ended up losing. And there are studies that show many teachers report, I think think I saw a study where 75, 80% of teachers say um, that students are quick to remind them that they can sue and that they can, they can in fact, they can in fact, you know, penalize the, the, the teachers. It is a system virtually upside down. Instead of teaching the students to obey proper authority, the teachers are being taught that they have to obey the wishes of the students. Does any of this comport with the idea that St. Paul had? If children understood that 
it was pleasing to God if they obeyed their parents, if they obeyed their teachers, if they obeyed their school principals. Would the would these would these students do the things that they're doing? Would they, in fact, maybe not be as hostile, not be as angry? Um, the more that this process goes on, the more you have situations where kids are violent. There's another case, New York City. There was a special ed, again, an emotionally, a special ed teacher. Again, uh, students with disability, with emotional disability problems being classified as special ed. This man's name was Jeffrey Gerstel. And there was a student that he'd pulled out of a classroom, pulled out of a classroom, because he was in the act of threatening to kill an assistant teacher. As he pulled the boy out of the room, the news uh, story reported that the boy, quote, collided with a bookcase. The boy required no medical attention. Even so, um, the mother uh, brought a lawsuit, and it ended up being settled out of court. But afterwards, uh, for the rest of the year, the students taunted uh, this particular teacher, basically saying, I'm going to get my mother up here and bring you up on charges. And so it happens. It's, and, and these stories are not, as I say, uncommon. They happen over and over and over again. Um, besides these particular things, um, you know, besides the schools, what about the parents? Um, there's a case. Uh, I mean, would this happen? Would, this, would students be acting this way in the classrooms if their parents were teaching them the value of obedience in the home? When a, when a principal suspends a student, when a special ed teacher pulls a child out of a classroom for threatening to kill an assistant teacher, do the parents say to the child later on, did you actually threaten to kill the teacher? What, 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 how can you possibly do such a thing? Or do the parents instead say, we're going to sue the school? Do the par- if the parents don't understand the value of obedience, obedience, obeying by the rules, obeying by the most basic rule, not to kill or even threaten to kill somebody else, what, you know, what can these children be learning and what can they understand? Take a simple case. This what happened in St. Louis earlier this year. Ledoux Horton Watkins High School. The student didn't get his way. The student was on the junior varsity soccer team. The student then, when he was, uh, I believe, a sophomore, the student then became a junior, tried out for the varsity soccer team. There were 24 slots available on the varsity soccer team. There were 40 students that were trying out. This particular student was on the bubble, and he missed out. Did he simply um, accept the decision of the soccer coach, the authority in this particular case, the magistrate and authorities as, as in this particular case? Or did he say, no, the authority is wrong. I say the authority is wrong. I should be given a spot on the soccer team. I, 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 why? What about the other kid? If he's given a spot on the soccer team to somebody else, does that mean somebody else has to lose his spot? Does he care about that other person? Does it even matter? Well, there was a lawsuit that was filed. And it was alleged that the school was guilty of discrimination. Um, He wasn't even allowed to go back to the junior varsity team because that was reserved for freshmen and sophomores. And so he simply couldn't play soccer. But he wouldn't accept that. And so he sued. He wanted to be put back. If he couldn't make the varsity team, he wanted to be put back on the junior varsity team. They would have to change the rules for him. So in this particular case, um, some other students were going to have to suffer. Somebody was going to be kicked off the junior varsity team, a freshman or a sophomore. When he had, uh, when he had benefited by this rule as a freshman or sophomore, um, the, he, was, he was allowed to be on the team. But now somebody else would not have the same benefit, or perhaps somebody would have less playing time, or perhaps, you know, somebody would have to share, you know, more resources or, or, or whatever it might be, but somebody else in some way was going to have to suffer on account of this, but it didn't matter because this person was not going to admit to the proper authorities. Do we have any more cases in America today? Oh, Yes. Um, or, for example, you could look to uh, just across the border in Quebec, Canada, for example, 10 years ago, 
a father disciplined his child. He grounded her. It was a daughter. The parents had been split up. The child, the daughter was living with her father. She was a teenager. She was chatting on the internet in ways that he didn't uh, prefer. She was also posting inappropriate, what were referred to as inappropriate pictures of herself. Father, father naturally uh, sought a way to make sure that she didn't do this anymore. So he grounded her, which prevented her from going on the school trip that she wanted to go on. So what did she do? She sued her father. Uh, actually, she was not a teenager. She was 12 years old, even younger. She sued her father. And what happened? She won. She won. What happened as a result of that? The child went back to live with her mother. The child and the father not speaking. Their relationship was torn. Why? Why is this necessary? Is the child any happier on account of this? If the child simply took her punishment, didn't go on a school trip, and didn't post inappropriate pictures of herself, we are talking about occasions where students are winning legal challenges, when they are threatening to kill or are th- posting inappropriate pictures of themselves. They can break rules of decency. They can commit sins and, and, and moral grievances and still win. Authority is being thwarted. This is ob- this is obviously not. This could all be avoided if people followed the principles that Paul was 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 recommending to us. You could take another case. Came out of a student in a Catholic high school in New Jersey. Parents set up rules. She had to do chores. She could not break curfew. It was a boyfriend they wanted her to break up with who was a bad influence on her. Whatever. In any event, they set the shortly before her 18th birthday, she said, I'm going to be an adult now. I don't have to do what you tell me. The parents said, well, if you don't do what we tell you, um, we're, not going to, we're not going to pay for your education. She sued in court. This time she lost. But a lawyer took her case and filed a lawsuit so that she could receive $624 a week in child support, uh, that she could seek $5,300 a year in tuition for a Catholic high school, that she could have access to a college fund, that she was to be paid $13,000 for legal fees, and oh, by the way, the parents of some friend of hers paid for the attorney so they could sue the parents of the child. Splitting up a family, splitting up the bonds of parents and a child, for the sake of being disobedient, for getting what you want, despite being told not to, even if it might be for your own good. This is what is taking place. In this particular case, there was a two and a half hour hearing in court where the mother was reduced to tears. Just like in the Quebec case, the relationship with the parent and the child being torn asunder. Why? For what purpose? Could it have been avoided? If obedience of obedience to a higher authority was followed, would this occur? Would these harms, would these damages to human relationships, would, the, would these pains take place? No, they could all be avoided. But what are the children learning from? Well, they're learning from the parents. They're learning from adults. In America today, we have multiple instances we can look at where adults are not uh, following authority. They're not obeying the rules. You know, one issue that is, that is a hot one lately is the uh, subject of sanctuary cities. There was a uh, mayoral candidate in San Francisco who, as a member of their town council, city council, originally proposed the ordinance. She was the original author of the ordinance that declared San Francisco a sanctuary city for immigrants, so that immigrants, so that Ill- immigrants who had not gone through the legal processes and were here in this country in accordance with the law, that these immigrants, these illegal immigrants, uh, would, necessar- would, would nonetheless be protected. They would not be, by, by, by government officials. They would not be reported uh, to uh, customs and immigration authorities uh, on the national level. She was the author of that ordinance for the city. She was a candidate for mayor in 2016. 
and she had proposed an amendment to that ordinance. Over the years, that ordinance had been amended so that violent felons were even included under the protections of the ordinance. So we have people that were not obeying the rules in terms of um, going through legal immigration channels and also not obeying the rules of society because they committed violent crimes against other people. And nonetheless, um, the sanctuary law in San Francisco protected them. And this uh, one mayoral candidate said that that should be changed. She was opposed by a number of other mayoral candidates. Um, it, it seems as if it seems as if it doesn't make sense. It certainly doesn't comport with this idea of obeying the rules. Even more so, even even perhaps a more glaring example of this is when a judge, um, given the task of enforcing the rules, chooses to disobey them herself. Again, just staying within this one same context of sanctuary cities. There was a case out in Portland. There was a judge, her name was Monica Harans. She had a, a man in their courtroom one day who had just pled guilty to driving under the influence of alcohol. Pled guilty to an offense that could have endangered the life of other people. And she was told that there were law, ICE agents for the Immigration Service outside in the in the halls of the, the courthouse. She didn't know for a fact if they were here for this particular defendant, but there were these ICE officials in the hallway. What if there were? Would it not be up to those officials to decide whether or not they were going to um, arrest this particular individual and seek his deportation? If they had lawful authority, um, should they not have the right to exercise it? This particular judge decided they did not. She allowed this particular person to escape through uh, a doorway that was reserved for court employees to thwart the law enforcement activities of these ICE agents. We have a judge who is deciding that obedience to the rules in this particular case can be thwarted. Was she alone in this? The uh, Portland, Oregon newspaper reported at the time that her action had divided the Portland legal community, divided it. So in other words, there were people that disagreed with her action and there were people who supported it. People who supported it. We can have a judge deciding that law, and we can have a judge potentially aiding and abetting uh, a criminal's escape. It, she didn't know if he was guilty uh, of whatever he might be charged with by these by these immigration officials. So, I mean, but the decision that she made was one that would, I mean, whether she was actually guilty of aiding and abetting or not, the fact of the matter is she made the value judgment that it was okay to do that. A judge if that is what's taking place in our society, how are children supposed to know that there's any value to obedience? Paul writes that we need to obey magistrates and we need to do it with a good heart. We need to have a graciousness towards everyone. And why? Because, he says, while he used to be disobedient and while he used to be uh, governed by malice and envy and while he used to be hateful and and hating others, then when the kindness and generous love of God our Savior appeared, not because of any righteous deeds we had done, but because of his mercy, he saved us through the bath of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he richly poured out on us through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that we might be justified by his grace and become heirs in the hope of eternal life. Obedience puts us on the path to eternal life. It is a path that now he can see. He's no longer deluded because 
of the bath uh, poured out on him by the of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ. There is nothing less than the presence of God in um, obeying authority. There is nothing less than being in accord with uh, the will of God when we obey authorities who have uh, some power over us. When we need to obey the rules, simply doing that uh, has a connection uh, to the will of God himself. In this country today, we are taking God out of the schools. We are taking the value of obedience out of the schools. We need to put it back. Uh, then we can have people that are going to be more peaceful. It is People will end up with more peace in their hearts, even if they have to sacrifice themselves in some minor way so they don't get what they want rather than getting what they want all the time, becoming more and more dissatisfied. As Augustine says, our hearts are restless, so they rest in God. When we, have, when we turn to God, we have peace of heart, then we will understand peace. This is what Paul is trying to tell us. These are words that he expressed 2,000 years ago, and yet they are so timely. They are so in need for us to understand today. This has been another edition of St. Paul's Letters to America. We thank you for listening and hope you'll join us again next time. Thank you and God bless. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.